So first of all, I'm totally stunned and thrilled to have received the Ruane Prize. Second of all, you're going to hear today words from an anti-reductionist. I've been that way since I was in college, and I hope to remain that way. And third, you're going to hear about a variety of research methodologies, summer camp programs for kids, longitudinal studies, experiments, clinical trials, uh, experiments of nature, uh, even narrative qualitative accounts. And we're going to talk a bit about ADHD. I'm not going to read every bullet point here. It's late in the afternoon. And talk just a little bit at the end about stigma, which is both an essential topic and the study of serious science these days. And the ultimate goal is to use science and the humanities and narrative to humanize people with mental disorders. One of the basic principles is the developmental psychopathology duo of equa and multifinality. Multiple roads lead to Rome, and a single risk factor may yield very different outcomes depending on other risk and protective factors, as we just heard this afternoon. So everybody knows that ADHD is just about bad schools and lacks parenting. There's no biology behind it. Medications are poisons to control young people's and adults' minds. All of these are myths. And I'm going to start the presentation uh, with the disclosure that I don't have any connection to pharma, no disclosures to make, but I'm going to show you a couple of ads for ADHD medications under the doctrine of fair use, that for science, you can look at advertisements and look at their content. So this will be very quick, but about 17 or 18 years ago, we saw this ad in Ladies Home Journal for Concerta. This is the stereotype of the day, a white middle-class mother and her white middle-class son. And she says something remarkable. When we give Jason Concerta, I see the real boy, not these annoying symptoms of ADHD. So if you do an analysis there, this is the world's first ADHD anti-stigma medication. Medicating your kid with ADHD removes the stigma and removes the shame. Very powerful message. We go to a few years later on an ad for Adderall XR, extended release. And the target here has moved into the biggest growing market for ADHD meds, uh, which is adults. And if you have really good eyesight, you can read citations to studies that show that ADHD in adulthood predicts divorce and major depression. Not sure what the causal arrows are. Again, a very powerful message. And then to show the current controversy, here's a more recent ad. Uh, it's a, a lot of megs in the slide that got cut off. Now we're diversifying into the first Hawaiian American to play Major League Baseball, Shane Victorino. Two World Series rings. And what does Shane say? I didn't outgrow my ADHD. That's why I'm telling my story. But there's a double meaning here. Shane couldn't take ADHD medications and play major league ball unless he had an ADHD diagnosis. Otherwise, he'd be thrown out for 81 games for using a performance enhancer. Major league baseball, the last time I checked, had twice the rate of stimulant exemptions and ADHD exemptions as the NBA or the NFL or the NHL, which proves a very interesting point that baseball is the most boring sport ever <laughs> to exist. So Sorry, Yankees and Mets fans. <laughs> Playoffs are indeed exciting. But think about it. What do you need to do in a four-hour baseball game? Be alert in that fourth hour for the curveball or the line drive. So this use fuels the controversy that people are just gaming the system and gaining diagnoses to get a performance-enhancing drug. ADHD is composed of the dimension of inattentive, disorganized behaviors, the dimension of hyperactive, impulsive behaviors. Despite the stereotypes, the impairment is real. $100 billion to the economy last year for kids, substance abuse, juvenile justice, $200 billion last year related to basically for adults employment-related issues. Kids with ADHD are more disliked than kids with autism or anxiety or depression or conduct disorder. Peer rejection is a huge predictor of later negative outcome. We'll talk more about families. The myth is that bad parenting causes ADHD. It's a substantially heritable condition. But what families do in response to this kid with troublesome symptoms does make difference for outcome. <laughs> 
recent data all over the place here and in Scandinavia, accidental injuries accrue from childhood or adult ADHD at substantial cost to persons and families and society. Our own data suggest for the largest study of girls with ADHD in the world that by the age of 25 to 30, 45 percent have had an unintended pregnancy versus 10 percent of our control group. So these are serious consequences. ADHD is a syndrome, it's not a disease. There are more boys than girls, as with all other neurodevelopmental disorders. We just saw the slide a couple presentations ago about the substantial heritability of ADHD. ADHD in kids and adolescents exists at about a 6 to 7 percent prevalence rate in any nation that has what? Compulsory education. Because compulsory education is the revealer of ADHD. But the two exceptions are the U.S. and Israel that at last count were about double the world's rate. Is there really more ADHD? Are we diagnosing it more? Stay awake in about 12 minutes. We'll have a little more to say about that. <laughs> Compulsory education, again, is the revealer of ADHD and learning problems. So let's talk about parenting. The classic two by two replicated around the world. Parents vary on the x-axis between low and high warmth and responsiveness, and on the y-axis between low and high control, uh, limit-setting, demandingness as parents. These are almost orthogonal in most studies, so that this upper right quadrant of high warmth and responsiveness and high limits yields what's commonly called as authoritative parenting, firm yet affirming. You love having your kids, you're not afraid to express limits. If we had more time, we'd talk about the other quadrants. Our question back in the day when I was running summer camps for boys was, is ADHD parenting a meaningful factor? We couldn't, little problem with the IRB at Berkeley, randomly assign kids with ADHD to live in different homes for the next 10 years, <laughs> slight problem. So we did a naturalistic study. And we measured parenting through videotaped interactions and through a parenting scale called the Ideas About Parenting Scale, which, as you can see at the bottom here, has a clear factor of authoritative parenting. You can see the warmth limits, autonomy, encouragement, reasoning with your kid. Our goal, this was a resilience study, was to predict social competence, who had good sociometric peer nominations at the end of our six-week summer camps. The bottom line first, the boys with ADHD received a lot lower authoritative parenting from their primary caregivers than the comparison boys. These are hard kids to be authoritative with. Nonetheless, the variance was high, and the only significant predictor, aside from day-to-day -day behavior observations in our programs, of social competence was the primary caregiver's authoritative responsive parenting. And intriguingly, the prediction in our control group was absolutely zero many ways to be popular if you're a typically developing boy, but a very significant prediction in the group with ADHD, suggesting that good parenting can protect against some of the, the core symptoms. Now, if you don't believe me, it's just a little bullet up here, see our friend's work, Gordon Harold from the United Kingdom, who's done the same thing in two large adoptive samples in the UK, where you've removed gene environment correlation and boys with ADHD, illicit negative parenting from parents, and that parenting, adjusting for everything else, predicts continued ADHD and comorbidities 10 years later. As heritable as ADHD is, parenting still makes a difference. Let's go quickly to peer relationships. Drew Earhart's dissertation, when I was still at UCLA a long time ago, was on the question of how long does it take a negative peer reputation to develop in boys with ADHD? And the answer was three hours because this was the first morning of the first day of our summer camp, when the boys had never met one another. We observed behavior and did a sociometric private interview on that first afternoon of the first day. Four and a half times greater likelihood of peer rejection that first afternoon. Discouragingly, depressingly quick. Why? The only significant predictor was the first morning's retaliatory aggression that many of the boys with ADHD displayed. If you want to develop a negative peer reputation quickly, make sure to argue with the ump after that called third strike in the first morning softball game. 
throw the spit wads at the teacher, and be a crybaby and retaliate back ineffectively when kids tease you. These are the variables that predicted this quick peer rejection. We'd like to treat inattention and impulsivity, but academic and peer competence are huge treatment targets. 25 years ago this month, I wrote a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health to study girls with ADHD, because I had learned in grad school that girls really don't get ADHD. They're anxious or they have conduct disorder, but not neurodevelopmental disorders like ADHD. And being a bit contrarian, I wanted to see what we could find. On our second round, we got a very good score and started a series of summer camps for girls with ADHD and a matched comparison group, and over time have followed them from girlhood to mid-adolescence to late adolescence, first years of adulthood into full emerging adulthood, average age of about 26. We've had remarkable success in about 94, 95% of the participants coming back each time. Let's go back quickly. At each wave, we've learned that girls with ADHD have many of the same impairments as do boys, academically, socially, neuropsychologically, uh, sometimes even more severe. So moving ahead quickly again, we began the longitudinal follow-up and by our third wave added to the battery measures of self-harm, both non-suicidal self-injury and actual suicide attempts. Making some headlines when these data came out in 2012, the girls who'd started during our summer camps with the combined form of ADHD, a lot of impulsivity as well as inattention, 23% had attempted their lives by the age of 20, 8% of our inattentive group, and six of our typically developing comparison girls. 6% is the national average. This is not some Bay Area skew. In terms of NSSI, non-suicidal self-injury, this is not hair twirling or cuticle picking, moderate to severe cutting or burning or other forms of mutilation, 51% of the combined or again, early impulsivity, about a quarter of the inattentive, and 19% of our typically developing girls. If you haven't noticed, non-suicidal self-injury is an epidemic among teenage boys, but especially girls, on into your 20s. So with our longitudinal data, we wanted to discover some of the reasons why. And if I get the right button, Wave one here to the left is either the category or the symptoms of ADHD, it doesn't really matter. Over to the right is the severity of NSSI at the average age of 20. And in adolescence, the two significant mediators were the cancel underline test, a classic neuropsych measure of response disinhibition, and the parents' and teachers' report of the girl's aggression and conduct symptoms. So externalizing symptoms and response inhibition are predicting to NSSI, but the only significant mediator of suicide attempts by age 20 was the parent and teacher and girl self-report of her depression and anxiety and withdrawal, her internalizing symptoms. Again, not to make this a working memory test, response disinhibition, externalizing, predicting NSSI, and internalizing symptoms, predicting suicide. What about peer relationships? It turns out, now the predictor here is a dimensional measure, a neuropsych measure, it could be ADHD symptoms. The girl self-reported in middle school being victimized by her peer group, physically or relationally, significantly mediated NSSI, NSSI severity, but the teacher's report of the proportion of classmates who have rejected the girl and made her a social outcast was the significant mediator of suicide attempts. What about trauma? Mayal Gundaman, now a postdoc from our lab, blindly coded with a team physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect blindly from the charts of all of our sample. Not surprisingly, girls with ADHD had somewhat higher risk for those forms of maltreatment, but most importantly, the girls with ADHD who had received one or more of those forms of maltreatment had a 34.5% of suicide attempt by the age of 20. Just like bipolar disorder, ADHD is highly heritable. For bipolar disorder, early maltreatment predicts earlier episodes, harder to treat episodes, and an increase in the already astronomical suicide risk. And ADHD is quite similar, isn't it? 
as heritable, 75 to 80%, but early maltreatment may start a pathway, epigenetically expressed, psychosocially expressed, of heightened risk for suicide. You can't believe it's all genes. You can't believe it's all environment. You have to integrate. I wrote a book with Richard Scheffler a few years ago called The ADHD Explosion. Richard's a health economist. We started a small research group of six people, just as Dennis talked about this morning and others have talked about. We did things that we would have never done alone, but we did things that we wouldn't have done if there had been uh, 200 people in the Kaufman Auditorium. Scheffler was a health economist who had heard me talk and talk about compulsory education and ADHD and said, ADHD is a disorder that's going to thrive when there's performance pressures. So we started to explore the huge ri rates and risks for diagnosis of ADHD and how much they've increased. So there's a lot in this slide, but the National Survey of Children's Health has shown that from the early part of the century till about 10 years later, there was a 41% increase in diagnosed ADHD in the United States. That's a big increase. Medication rates have remained flat for kids. About two-thirds get it. What might explain this? And even more, what about variability? From the 2012 data from CDC, some states, South and Midwest, have rates of ADHD diagnosis that are two or three times higher than way out West, where we tend to diagnose more at the international average. Well, it must be demographics. More African-American kids in the South, more Hispanic kids in California. Didn't explain the difference. Neither did the number of pediatricians or child psychiatrists. Neither did any kind of cultural factors that we could think about. Whether a state had enacted a consequential accountability law made a big difference. These are the laws that prioritize test scores. And your district gets dinged or taken into receivership if your test scores aren't rising. 30 states had passed such legislation before 1999. What happened when George Bush II was elected the first major piece of domestic legislation he passed was No Child Left Behind that made the re remaining 20 states automatically get consequential accountability starting in 2002, which was the baseline year of the national prevalence data. We predicted this would be a big a finding, if you will, for the poorest kids in a given state because it's public Title I schools that would be most, effect most affected. Very quickly, the blue line at the top, in a four to five year period, if you were in a state that suddenly got consequential accountability and you live near the poverty line, 51% increase in ADHD diagnoses over that five year interval. Not nearly as much if you were a middle class kid or a kid going to a private school. So what does consequential accountability have to do with ADHD? Number one, if you're a district superintendent, you may want to get kids diagnosed so they get treatment. And number two, until this became illegal in 2010, if you got a kid a sudden diagnosis of ADHD, they were special ed, oh, and their scores didn't count in next spring's testing. So there was an explicit gaming of the system. All this is against the backdrop of what? The average length of time to get an ADHD diagnosis in the United States is 10 to 12 minutes in a pediatrician's office without rating scales of developmental history or testing. We're going to pay now for good assessments or we're going to pay later. Two treatment slides. I promise you two. If you want to reduce the symptoms of ADHD, stimulant medication does a good job 70 to 80 percent of the time. If you want to improve comorbidities, academic achievement, peer relationships, and parenting, the combined, the dark slide lowers better here, it's improvement. The combination treatment does a, a far superior job to unimodal treatments. Second, despite the high heritability of ADHD, the red line here are kids who got the combination treatment in the MTA study, whose parents dramatically improved toward authoritative parenting over a year and a quarter period. That red group's decrease made 
them kids who look just like their typically developing peers by teachers, reports, and observers in classrooms. If you want to normalize behavior, it's not just medication, it's not just behavior therapy, it's improved parenting. So what is stigma? This would be a whole other talk. It's a Greek term signifying initially a brand cut into your skin. Stigma today is much more psychological. What are the bottom three groups in today's society, here in the US and basically around the world, for receiving stigma? Homelessness, substance abuse, and mental health issues. The public knows far more than in the 50s, and attitudes have remained exactly flat. Oh, but three times more Americans than in 55 automatically associate the term mental illness with danger and violence. So in some ways, we've gone backwards. We're doing a lot of things in our lab to fight stigma. I wrote a book on this topic uh, about 10 years ago. We know from empirical studies, we even know from state laws. As I say advisedly, if you're crazy enough to admit a mental illness in our country, you can't vote, serve on a jury, run for office, and you automatically lose custody of your kids. Good thing these laws weren't on the books in 1860. Lincoln would not have been a candidate for president. So, with multiple methods. Uh, I wrote a book on this topic about our family's journey through serious mental illness, uh, sprinkled in with uh, commentary on stigma. And my own upbringing in Columbus, Ohio, dad was a philosopher at Ohio State, mom was a lecturer in English, idyllic childhood, 50-yard line seats at Ohio Stadium, except that dad would disappear for three months, six months, or 12 months at a time, and we never knew why and weren't allowed to discuss it. He was in some of the country's worst mental hospitals for what was thought to be chronic schizophrenia. I helped later diagnose accurately as bipolar disorder. And his lead doctor told him when my sister and I were little, if your children ever learn of your mental illness, you'll be, they'll be permanently destroyed. You and your wife are forbidden from ever mentioning the topic. That was the medical advice. What would we think of an oncologist today who said, uh, if your children learn of your cancer, they'll be permanently destroyed. But remember, cancer in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s of last century was never put in an obituary because it was a shameful disease that you had essentially brought on yourself because you'd lost the will to live. Cancer's a cause today. The NFL dudes, one of these next couple of Sundays, will be wearing their pink knee socks to fight breast cancer. And where is the mental health and neurodevelopmental Sunday for the NFL? Well, we don't have it yet. Through narrative, through clinical trials we're now doing in high schools throughout California, trying to spread around the country, we're doing clubs, not mental health interventions, clubs, club week, kids can sign up for the anti-stigma club and devise and design a curriculum over the next 39, 40 weeks using our guidebook of evidence-based procedures to develop procedures for contact and humanization. Uh, we just got accepted this week, a clinical trial in the journal Stigma and Health. So I'm over time, want to thank my lab, all the participants in our studies, uh, funding from federal and foundation sources, uh, including BBRF at this point. Thanks so much for the Ruane Prize. Thanks. <laughs> oh, you're not done yet. Oh, I'm not yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. I want to oh, congratulate doing questions? you right. for having more fascinating material crammed into a single lecture than I've heard in a long time. We got a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am, way over in the corner. Somebody got a microphone, yeah. yeah. Hi there, I'm a school psychologist and a clinical psychologist, and I work with many families in schools where children have clinically significant symptoms of ADHD. Um, and many times we do feel that the parent has a role in consistency and how they reinforce the behavior or ignore behaviors and so on. Um, but in schools, we're told to focus on what we could do in the school setting because we can't, we're not in the home. And also parents are often not willing to acknowledge their role. They, they'll say, well, what are you doing in the school? You need, and of course we are working increasing time on task, task completion. We're doing a lot to help the children, but um, we're not always having partners. Intervention for ADHD requires consistency, target goals, home and school working together. Remember the heritability of ADHD, 75, 80, 82%, meaning roughly 
that 40 to 45% of biological parents of kids with ADHD will have ADHD themselves subclinically or clinically diagnosed or not. What do you have to do to be the parent of a kid with ADHD? You gotta be a super parent. Never raise your voice, always be organized, your own checkbooks are balanced. Gene environment correlation suggests that parenting attributes and traits and kid attributes and traits are a potent mix in many homes of kids with ADHD. So what we need to do is change our practice so that it's medicine and it's parent intervention and it's school consultation and social skills groups thrown into one. Uh, I know, you can, in many districts you can't talk about it. One last question, and unfortunately we'll have to move yeah. on. Yeah. Hi, hello. Hello. Give it a shot. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, now. Hi. Um, my name is Danielle Kirk. I am president and founder of Lilly, Live in Light Institute. We're a global initiative to destigmatize mental illness and addiction. And I'm specifically uh, interested in, forgive me, I have not read your books yet. Have you done any studies about- well, what are you doing in the next 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I do know what I'm doing all weekend. <laughs> I already canceled all my appointments. Um, I'm curious to know if you've done any studies, like cross-cultural studies on stigma. Um, I personally have just come back from an 18-month fundraising tour globally from the East, Middle East, and Western Europe, and the attitudes are drastically different in each of the cultures, Western Europe probably being the most progressive is what I found. Well, stigma, no, unfortunately, knows no cultural barriers or boundaries. You'd think, well, a collectivist Eastern country versus an individualistic Western country would have better attitudes, but in many Eastern countries, uh, if you have family mental illness or you yourself, you're not good marriage property, not arranged marriage. So socialist, democratic, Republican, collectivist, individualistic, stigma levels remain high, and there's evolutionary theories about why we reject people who look like they're contagious, et cetera. Stigma, Reduction is not going to be an easy battle, but it's got to be an international battle. So on that, I think, are we yeah, at our time? We're done. Okay, great. That's a shame. Thanks I so much. More questions myself. Thank you.